you're watching online, we want to say welcome to Grace Church. And if you're here on campus, we're delighted that you're here as well. And today we're going to come back to the book of Colossians. We took a break for Easter. And today we're back in Colossians chapter number 3. We're going to be look at, looking at verses 1 through 4. So let's read those verses together. And then we're going to dive right into them and see what the Lord has to say to us today. Paul says to the Colossian believers, he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. There is so much meat in this section of Scripture. And you want to take it word by word, line by line, challenge you this week to reread this passage and to meditate on what is really being said here. And I'll try to help you understand a couple things, but really it, it's all on you to go back and look at these verses. They are so good. So let's start with this question. What does it mean to seek things above? What does that mean? To set your mind on the things that are above. Well, it's not an easy answer. And it is not just about thinking about heaven. That's part of it. You know, when we think about heaven, the streets of gold, the heavenly choirs, the mansion, the place that God has prepared for us, it is just a glorious thing. It's encouraging to think about that, right? Let me ask that question again. It's encouraging to think about that, right? I mean, when you think about what heaven, what God has provided for us, it is an amazing thing. But is that all that this is talking about? And I want to suggest to you that it's not. There's something deeper, not that it takes away from heaven in any way, shape, or form. So what else would it be talking about? It's also, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about Christ's kingdom and his reign. Seek his kingdom and his reign. It is a place uh, that is so powerful. So what is the kingdom of God according to the prophet Zechariah? So let me give you a, 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 a description of the kingdom of God that Zechariah the prophet, chapter number 8, describes for us of what it's like when Jesus reigns on the planet. When the kingdom of God is here for real, the thing that we're supposed to be seeking right now. First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, it is a place where the Lord dwells. That's first and foremost. The kingdom of God is where the Lord dwells in power and authority and glory. It's a beautiful place. It is a place where old people are no longer cold and lonely. This is, this is Zechariah the prophet saying this, that old people are no longer cold or lonely or senile. They don't lose their minds, but they are participants in a community. It is where the elderly can sit together and bask in the sun and talk and laugh about the good old days in full vigor and clear mind and satisfaction of life. That's the kingdom of God, according to Zechariah chapter number 8. The kingdom of God is a place where little children can run and play in the squares and the open marketplaces in safety and fun and delight. Can't do that in Reno, right? But in the kingdom of God to come, that's what it looks like. It is a place where no child is abused or unwanted or malnourished, where there's not even a bully among the group. That's the kingdom of God, according to Zechariah. The kingdom of God says, it is a pla the kingdom of God, says Zechariah, is a place where the streets are safe for everyone. That is what the kingdom of God is like, according to Zechariah, and that's what we're supposed to be seeking. When you think about the kingdom of God, you and I are supposed to in be influencing the kingdom of God on this planet right now. So Paul says, seek first that kingdom. Seek that kingdom. Seek the things which are above. Seek God's will for your life. The struggle and the problem that you and I mainly have is truthfully... We're more concerned about our kingdom than God's kingdom. Stop there for a minute. Don't pass on too quickly. I think if you just give yourself one simple test, one simple question in your life, what do you spend more time thinking about? Your finances or giving to the kingdom? What do you spend more time thinking about? What you can acquire, what kind of a job you can have, where you can vacation, where you're going to get your next coffee drink. I mean, all those things are things that are evidence of the fact that none of those things are wrong in and of themselves. It's that when they dominate our life, 
it's an evidence that we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We chase after things that are futile. I mean, bottom line is that they, they don't offer anything. In the end, it's all empty. We end in the grave. There is no, there's no one that's going to be exempt from that except if we're here when the Lord comes back. We're all in the same place. And uh, it's, it's a futile experience. When you think about life without God, life without the kingdom. So the believer is to be thinking about seeking those things which are above. That's not, listen to me very carefully and smile at me when I say, say this. This is not a suggestion. God doesn't say, you know, oh, by the way, if you have time. You know, if it's not too bothersome, if it doesn't interfere with your plans today, then seek those things which are above. No, this, this is a command from God for those who have given their life to Jesus. It occurred to me a while back when I was watching The Roadrunner with my grandchildren. Great cartoon. The Roadrunner is like the world, and no matter how hard, Wile E. Coyote is like us, and the Roadrunner is like the world. No matter how hard we chase after the world, we always end up in the same place. So let me show it to you. Honestly, isn't that how it works out in life? No matter how hard we chase after things, they're elusive. We're just one step away from getting what our, our dreams are. And, you know, all sorts of self-help books tell us how, honestly, we can get a better life. But I'm telling you the truth. What the Bible says is the goal is to seek that which is above. That's the goal of the believer's life. So Paul gives us two commands <clears throat> to think about. First of all, he tells us to seek, and then he tells us to think. So let's talk about those things. Think about this. Think about this process. I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I've stepped over the line. Have you? Amen? Are you a part of the fellowship of the unashamed? The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I won't, I won't back up, let go, slow down, back away, or be still. My past has been redeemed. My future has been secured. I'm, I am finished and done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living, dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. What about you? Is that true of your life? I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, live by prayer, labor by his power. My face is set, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, but my mission is clear. How about you? I cannot be bought, deluded, or laid. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of my enemies. I will give up, shut up, until I have stayed up, stayed up, stored up, prayed up, and preached up for the cause of Jesus. What about you? I'm a disciple of Jesus. I am a disciple of Jesus. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me because I seek those things which are above. That's the goal. That's the command. That's what you and I are to be about. Seeking those things which are above where Christ sits. And that is such an important thing for us to understand. That it, that's what it means, by the way, to seek those things above. So the question is, how do I know, how do I know in my own life when I am too invested in this world? How do I know when I'm stuck here? How do I know when the balance is off, when I am not seeking the things that are above? Is there a test? Is there a way for me to discover that I'm not seeking the kingdom of God? That I'm not seeking what is above? The answer that, to that question is absolutely yes. And here is, this, here is the test. How often do you worry about things like clothes or houses or careers or money? How often do you worry about health and security? Worry is really the, the, the 
the teller of all things. It's the indicator. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he proceeded to talk about the concept of worry. Worry is the antithesis of seeking the kingdom of God first. So when I am freaked out, worried out, filled with anxiety, I'm not seeking that which is above. So seek first, seek first then is the command that God gives in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God. So why should the kingdom of God dominate my heart and mind? There are two reasons. First of all, this is so good, so don't miss this. Don't miss this. In fact, I would write some notes here if I were you. I'd go back and listen to this. I began to think about this because this is the key. What I'm about to tell you is the key to hearing these words at the end of your life. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So are you ready? Okay, I don't think some of you are ready yet. This is, I know it's nine o'clock, it's early. Come on now, come on now. We've got to get better than that, right? So are you ready? Yeah. All right, good. So there are two reasons that I should seek first the kingdom, seek that which is above. Number one, it's the past. So let me tell you about your past. If you've claimed to cross over the line of faith and believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you what has happened to you right now. Listen to this very carefully. The past simply is, this is the truth, I've died. I've died. I no longer have my life it's not my life. It's not my truth. It's God's. So let me show you that. Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died to this life. Isn't that clear? So if you have crossed that line of faith, the Bible says you have died this life. So what now remains for me? And your real life, I love that phrase. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life isn't here on this planet. That's not your real life. Your real life isn't what you can attain. Your real life isn't your preeminence here. Your real life isn't your success. Your real life is the life that God gives you because, you're, because according to his word, you've died. And now you have this new life that's found in Jesus Christ and him alone. So there's this old dead guy by the name of St. Augustine. <clears throat> and before his conversion, he was married, but he had a girlfriend named Claudia. Shortly after he found Christ, he was on the streets one day, and Claudia, his girlfriend, saw him. And she cried out, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. And he paid no attention. She said, it's me, Claudia. It's me, Claudia. Don't you recognize me? But he said, it's no longer Augustine. See, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the nature of what it means to follow Jesus. It's not about you anymore. You're not the center of the world. You're not the center of the universe. You are now a servant of Jesus, and your life is found in him. And when you find the meaning of that, when you understand the meaning of that, when you discover the meaning of that, you're about ready to have God explode in a very powerful way on your life. To entrust you with things that he wants to entrust you with, but he can't trust you if you're going to be a glory seeker. If you're going to be a person who seeks your kingdom, who looks for your prosperity, who looks for your popularity, he can't entrust you with these amazing riches that he has, spiritually speaking. So when you find and discover what it means that your life is dead and hid in Christ, that's the beginning of life. That's the beginning of joy and peace and long-suffering and joy. Anybody want those things? Anybody want those things? They're only found when you find your death in Christ. That's where they're found. That's what Colossians says. That's why this passage is so filled with meat for me to understand what it means to have died. It isn't that I have to put myself to death. It's a fact. Paul is saying, don't you understand something? You died. You died. This is past tense. 
The moment you said yes to Jesus, you died. Now you just have to, <clears throat> excuse me, appropriate that death every step of the way, every day of your life. The second reason is the future. And the future is simply this, is that I'm glorified. Watch this, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. That is so good. We are living in flesh and blood bodies which cannot inherit and participate in the coming fullness of the kingdom. Do you realize that? Your, your earth suit cannot participate fully in what God has for you for the future. So what God is planning to do with you, and in the original Greek in this text, this is in past tense. God has already, as if it's already happened, God has already glorified you. It's a done deal. It's finished in heaven. The paperwork's been done. The passport's been given. You now have been, listen to this, have been glorified. That's what Colossians says. And yet I live as if it's not. And so I await this amazing future that God has for me. Where I will appear with him in glory. The day is coming, the day of the Lord. When Jesus comes back, when the last trumpet sounds. And at that time, bodies of the believers, whether dead or alive, will be changed. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be the same person, yet different. This body right here is only meant for the kingdom of earth. But there's a kingdom of heaven coming that you need a new body for. And you'll be changed and you will fully enter this eternal life in bodies that will never die. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? So therefore, death is not to be feared. Thank you so much. So kind to me. Therefore, death is not to be feared. We shall live, literally, in a body that God prepares just for you. And here's what's funny. Can I speak to all my workout friends for just a minute? <laughs> Smile at me when I say this. I mean, this is so good. You're going to work all the days of your life, and I'm going to get a better body than you have now. Isn't that true? That's what, I have, that's what I have to look forward to. That's what God promises me. Think about eternity. You know, I have lived here on this planet for, you know, 60-some years, and uh, it's been a good run. I've, God has been good to me all the days of my life. I sang that song, too. It's a really amazing song, a real amazing truth. But my best days are yet to come. And I'm going to live. Yeah, it's true. My best days are yet to come. And I'm going to live, listen to this, 60 years on this side, or it's better so far. <laughs> and on the other side, never ending. For all eternity. And so, and I'm going to live in this body that never decays. It never has disease. It never shrinks. It never it never grows old. It is a, it's fashion like Christ's resurrected body. It is powerful. And uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like a cocoon that turns into a butterfly. Which would you rather be? You know, this fungi looking thing? <laughs> or this beautiful, magnificent creature? They're the same in essence, but different in appearance, right? That's what happens. It's not like I won't recognize you. I'll see you in heaven and we'll say, hey, how you doing? And we'll sit down, I'll come over to your house for a thousand years. And <laughs> because, you know, a thousand years is like a day in heaven, right? So I'll come over to your house for a thousand years and, and it'll seem like just a second. And uh, I don't know what all is prepared for us. But here's what I do know. What is there is so much better than what is here. It can't even be compared and so what's ironic is, is that we hold on to this life like, like there's no more tomorrow, right? You know, we think about this life, we grasp after it, we, we, you know, we hold on to it, we, you know, we resist, we resist death, we resist. But, you know, if we really believed what the Bible says, it wouldn't be something that we would fear. It'd be something that we embrace fully. And it's such a powerful thing. So let me show you God's plan for your life, if you don't mind. 
this is this is amazing. This is God's plan for your life. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance. Before that romantic evening that your parents had, God knew you. God knew you. Planned for you. That's what the Bible says. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. So you're chosen to be like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. So if you are his today, if you believe in him, if you are a, a Christ follower, it's not because you're smart. It's not because you have this supernatural spiritual intelligence. It's the truth is, is that you were called by him. You were chosen by him. He's the one that initiated the relationship. And he gave us this thing called, I'm going to give you a really big word here, efficacious grace. That's a word that you ought to think about it and understand a little bit. Efficacious grace means that it's irresistible. When our eyes are opened, we can't see it until our eyes are opened. You cannot see. You cannot see salvation. You cannot see the future. You cannot see what God has for you until your eyes are opened by God. Efficacious grace. And when, and when your eyes are opened by God, you can't resist it. I mean, slam your hand in a door, you know, in a car door, or go have ice cream. Which, what would you choose? I mean, that's efficacious grace. I'm going to take ice cream, right? Spend eternity in hell or have the blessings of God all the days of your life forever and ever and ever and ever. Enjoy the company of the other saints and enjoy the presence of God. Which would you choose? And the truth is, is when we, our eyes are open, it's so obvious what the choice is. That's what Paul says here. And having chose, chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. Took broken people, took people that are all messed up. I don't know many of your lives, but here's what I can, this is what I'm going to predict that I know. I know that if the story were told about your life, here's the reality is you've got a really messed up past. Right? And kind of a messy present. But your future. <laughs> Your future is certain. And so he, he gave you right standing before God. You didn't earn it. You didn't try to attain it. It was a gift of grace. His goodness chased you down. His goodness chased you down until you couldn't resist anymore. And you said yes. That's what this verse says. And having given them right standing, watch this. He gave them his glory. It's a done deal. This is a done deal. And if that is all true, if all of that is true, and how many say amen to that? Amen. If that is all true, then why in the world do we act the way we act? Fuss about the things we fuss about. Struggle with the things we struggle with. If that is all true, if this is all true, and I believe it is, amen? If that's all true, why do we cling so hard to this life? C.S. Lewis, you ever heard of him? Great scholar, old dead guy, in heaven today, says this, said this, not says this. Well, he probably says it today too. C.S. Lewis said we are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who goes on making mud pies in, in, the, in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday by the sea. We're content playing in the mud because we don't see what God is preparing for us for the future. And if we could just get a glimpse into that, that's what Paul says in Colossians, then we would all the days of our life seek that which is above. Seek first that which is above. Set our minds on the things that are above. 
the things that God has prepared, things that we can't even begin to imagine. So if we really comprehend that, it demands for me to have a different lifestyle. It demands for me to stop worrying about present circumstances. If I really get this, it demands of my life. It imputes to my life this sense of wellness and wholeness that medical science can't give, that no amount of yoga or self-meditation can give. Sorry, friends. This comes from God and God alone. And this is so true. This is so amazing. This is great truth. This nugget of four verses is life-changing. Sometimes we act as if God's goodness and promises don't exist. Just simply because we get all muddied down in the mire, we just get way down in the mud, and we are content. We're just content, according to C.S. Lewis, with just making mud pies. When God has something for you in this present life that's far bigger than that, but he's got he's to he's have, you, have your eyes open because if you're just going to consume it upon yourself, he can't trust you yet with it. So if I were sitting in your seat today, I'd go back to Colossians chapter 1 this week. Open your Bible or your device or whatever you're going to do. And I'd read it again and again and again and again until the lights come on. Because this is true spirituality. This is what God has called you to. And I pray and my hope and my desire is that once that happens, once that happens, then you'll really be able to sing with all of your heart about how God's goodness has pursued you and chased you down all the days of your life. God bless.